F1 is a game series that's been around for many years, and with the recently released F1 23 from Codemasters and EA, we decided to look at how the game runs on a load of different graphics cards. So we tested a whopping 30 cards at three different graphics settings at three different resolutions to find out. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. I'm never gonna be an esports gamer. I never get any kills. I wouldn't be so sure of that. Is that Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com? Yes, my son, it is me, Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com. What are you doing here? I'm here to bestow upon you a gift that will transform you into a true gamer. With a 24.5 inch full HD screen, 240 hertz refresh rate, 0.5 millisecond response time, AMD FreeSync Premium, and height adjustability, you'll be gaming in the big leagues in no time. Oh, thank you. No problem, my son. Why don't you check out the link in the description below to find out more. Okay, so I'd like to clear the air a bit first. At the time that this video actually goes out, the game has already been out for a few weeks. So why didn't we make this video sooner? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons. The first was going to Computex, which took a lot of time out of our schedules since we had so many things to make videos about, even after we returned. The next thing was the testing itself. 30 cards is a lot and each card got tested nine different times at least. So that's a total of 270 test runs, if my maths is any good, with each test running for a minute straight. So accounting for changing the card and launching the game, going through the settings, that would be about six hours of non-stop testing if nothing goes wrong. Of course, things went wrong. We ended up having performance issues after about the first hour that made us change our testing entirely. And on top of that, we had problems with the beta drivers we were using. So between each card, the drivers needed to be fully uninstalled using DDU and then reinstalled, adding a lot more time, purely because the performance was just way off the mark. Then finally, with other things taking priority, like the launch of the RTX 4060 series cards, well, we ended up quite a bit behind. Now, many hours and many, many retests later, we finally have results to share. So let's actually have a look at them. Now, the test bench we used consisted of an Intel Core i9-12900K cooled by a Notchware MHD15S with 32 gig of Patriot Viper Venom 6200 MHz DDR5 memory on an ASUS ROG Maximus Hero Z690 motherboard with a Seagate Fire Cuda 530 NVMe SSD as our main boot drive. Finally, everything was powered by a Thermaltake Tough Power GF3 1350W gold power supply, so no problem with, say, the RTX 4090. So yeah, with that all out of the way, let's get into those glorious benchmarks. Starting with the medium preset at 1080p, we see the top performer was actually the RX 7900 XTX with a huge 551 FPS average. Now what's interesting is that the top performers here are all AMD. We don't see anything from Nvidia until a few places down where the 3090 Ti is sitting. We also see the 4070 Ti outperforming both the 4080 and 4090, but this is likely due to a bottleneck from the CPU, and we will probably see this change in the higher resolutions. Now further down the list we see the 4060 Ti struggling to keep up with the 3070 and 6700 XT, whilst the 7600 also falls behind by quite a bit, with just 2 frames a second less than the RX 6700's 345 FPS. Moving up to 1440p, we see the 7900 XTX still reigning supreme with 500 FPS average, but the 4090 has caught up quite a bit, now sitting just one space below with only 5% less performance. The 4080 has also jumped up in the list, now performing better than the 3090 Ti, and a lot of the AMD cards that were top performers at 1080p. The 3070 still has higher frame rates than the 4060 Ti and the RX 7600, whilst the 4060 hasn't really gone anywhere. But with almost all our cards still comfortably above 100 FPS at these settings, it's hard to complain about any of the card's performance. At 4K, the 4090 finally decides to stretch its legs, taking up the top spot in our results with only a small difference in performance between it and the 7900 XTX, which is a pretty noticeable jump above the 7900 XT and the RTX 4080. The RTX 4070 Ti is caught up now as well, performing 12% worse than the 3090 Ti, but comes in identical to the 3080 Ti at 223 FPS. The RX 6800 performs a little better than the 4070 with 179 FPS versus the 4070's 174, but a lot better than the 4060 Ti which ran 22% slower. Even at 4K, we didn't see many cards performing under 100 FPS, with only one card actually performing under 60, that being the 6500 XT, which I suspect will be the weakest performer in every test. 
Changing our graphics preset to high, we see that at 1080p, the 4090 still has some bottleneck issues at 447 FPS. Whilst the 7900 XTX maintains its position as the superior card for 1080p at 503 frames per second, with the 7900 XT sitting between the two at 473 FPS. The RTX 4080 performed very similarly to the 4090 at 443 FPS, while in terms of placement, the 4070 Ti didn't really see a drop, but instead it's performing closer to what we would expect relative to the higher power cards. The 4070 is still being outperformed by some of last generation's higher tier cards like the 6800 XT and the RTX 3080 10 gig, and then as we get further down the list, the performance decreases pretty steadily with a 22% performance jump going down from the RX 6600 to the RTX 3050. And then we see a huge, almost 100 FPS drop down to the RX 6500 XT, losing 61% of the frames. Again, easily making this the worst performing card here. At 1440p, the 4090 and 7900 XTX are neck and neck with only 10 FPS between them. And then from there, we see a decent drop down to the 7900 XT, which still garners an impressive 366 FPS. We then see a steady decline in performance down the list until we reach the 6900 XT, which earns 10% less FPS than the 3090 Ti that sits just above it in our chart. Looking further down the chart some more, we see this happen once again when we reach the RTX 4070, which performs 9% worse than the 3090. And then we also see a 13% drop in performance going from the RX 6800 to the 6750 XT. From here, the decline in performance is very gradual up until the 36 FPS loss in performance that the RTX 3050 sees compared to the 6600. And at the very bottom of our chart, we see our old friend, the RX 6500 XT with 49 FPS on average, a drop of 48 frames from the 3050's 97. Moving up to 4K, the 4090 is again at the top of the list with a 12% jump in performance over the 7900 XTX, which also has a large jump in performance of 31 FPS over the 7900 XT. In general here, we don't see anything out of the ordinary with the cards performing pretty much as we expect them. And aside from the ones at the top of the chart that I mentioned, there aren't really any big drops in performance as we work our way down the list. Now it is worth noting however that whilst the 3050 managed to maintain a frame rate above 30 FPS, the 6500 XT didn't, with an average FPS of 26 and some stuttering all the way down to 21 FPS. Our final round of testing involved changing our settings up to the ultra high preset which automatically enables ray tracing. So first things first, the 4090 is way ahead of everything else at 258 FPS. That's a 20% performance jump over the 4080, which came in at 206 FPS. A drop of 33 FPS brings us down to the 4070 Ti, which is the first time we've seen it performing better than the 7900 XTX, albeit only by a single frame. Overall here, we see Nvidia performing better than the AMD cards, but with their ray tracing performance being ahead, this isn't really a surprise. And in general, at 1080p, you can expect pretty much any card to give you playable frame rates, even with ray tracing, aside from the 6500 XT, of course. Moving up to 1440p, we see a giant difference in performance between the RTX 4090 and everything else, with 26% more frames than the next best performing card, the RTX 4080. From here, there isn't really much to say in terms of performance, much like with 1080p. The cards perform as you would expect them to, with a steady decline in frame rates until we see again the 6500 XT earning an unplayable 11 FPS. Our final test is ray tracing at 4K, and to be honest, this is the testing I wanted to talk about most, because so many cards ran this game so well throughout the entirety of testing. It was actually fun to reach a point where some of these cards became frankly unplayable. At the top of our list is of course the RTX 4090, proven to be the 4K king time and time again, and that is no surprise, but just how big the jump is from the RTX 4080 is actually quite surprising, with 47% more performance going up to the 4090. From there the list goes pretty much as you would expect, and anything higher end than an RX 6800 or 3060 Ti will give you playable results at 4K with ray tracing. Now what I do want to look at in more detail however is the lower tier cards. What we see is that neither of the RTX 4060 family cards were able to maintain a frame rate over 30 FPS. And though the 4060 Ti came close with 29 FPS, didn't quite break that mark. We also see the RX 7600 failing to even reach 20 FPS, coming in at just 18. This was the point where it started getting pretty difficult to play. And from here, things got slightly worse with each subsequent card until we reached the RX 6500 XT, which came in at just four FPS average meaning that it was the only card that you couldn't even try to power through with. 
The performance was so bad that the car moved slower than in any other test and was honestly quite painful to test. So performance overall was pretty close to what you would expect with a few notable points to make. First, the RTX 4090, whilst it is the 4K king in the lower frame rates at the lower settings, well, this card really showed its bottlenecks and proved that for some reason, the most powerful isn't always the best. Now, the 7900 XTX and 7900 XT were proven to be a hard battle for Nvidia at 1080 and 1440p. And even in ray tracing, they managed to keep up more than you would maybe expect. So pushing cards beyond what they are advertised for us also gave us better results than we expected with the exception of, again, the 6500 XT, which is pretty awful anything other than 1080p, but kind of expected anyway. Now, all of this analysis of how the cards run at different settings is kind of pointless though, if we don't have a look at what these settings actually do to the visuals within the game. Now, firstly, for the record, all of the footage we will be looking at for comparison here was recorded on an RTX 4090 at 4K. So starting with ultra low, we can see that the draw distance well, isn't exactly amazing, with a stationary set of low resolution trees not that far ahead of us. Details on the car are a bit low in resolution as well, but overall, it's not actually too bad. Since this is what will always be seen, there is kind of more emphasis put into making this look good than the trees you'll be driving past at high speed. Moving up to low, we can see the draw distance has started to bring the closest low resolution trees into high resolution model, but with this being a background piece, it's still not the priority. The car has gained a bit more resolution in the decals with the zoom logo, for example, gaining some softness and just overall looking quite a bit better. At medium, we see that the trees are all now a higher res version, even if they aren't all animated, which is done to reduce the resources needed for these background objects. The car details have improved again and are quite a bit smoother, even though they are still a little rough around the edges. Going from medium to high, we see the car hasn't changed much at all, but the background details again have all gained some resolution and clarity, with the distance that animations start playing being extended on top of that. Finally, ultra high with the ray tracing setting, and at first glance, it's hard to find any difference between this and high. But upon further inspection, we see that the little things are where it's at. The reflections on the edges of the side mirrors and where the Hard Rock Cafe logos are, they do actually show some more definition in the reflections that are more accurate to the game world. Honestly though, I'm not sure you'd really be able to tell, and this might not be worth the performance loss. So to check this, I also tried high and ultra in wet conditions to see how the reflections change in the water. Comparing high to ultra high with the rain just confirms my suspicions. Whilst we do see more accurate and lifelike reflections from the ray tracing, they're flying by so fast that it's kind of really hard to notice unless you are really looking for it. But it's a racing game. You aren't staring at the puddles on the ground. So really, unless you have a card that can push ray tracing with a high frame rate, it's pretty much pointless using ray tracing in this game, at least in my opinion. Now I do want to mention that during our time testing the game, we didn't come across any bugs or graphical errors or really anything at all that got in the way of gameplay, which is nice to see in the modern age of throw it out the door style of game releases. At launch, we have a functional game that runs and plays well. In terms of gameplay, what is there for me to say? If this is your type of game, then you kind of already knew it. I get that this style of racing game isn't exactly for everyone, but for those who enjoy these games, then this is just more of what you already love, but in a new package with more stuff to enjoy. I guess the only thing that really is worth mentioning is that the built-in benchmark mode well, at least for us, did throw up some issues, which wasted a lot of our time and led us to testing in a manual benchmark instead. And that's what you saw in terms of the results here today, a manual benchmark run that we did. Yeah, when we was testing using the built-in benchmark mode, we were having cards, even at 4K, that were outperforming the 4090. Test them again, get completely different results. So that's why we kind of had to go back to the drawing board. Now, in terms of performance, there really isn't much to say because, well, when we tested 30 cards, the charts kind of speak for themselves. Now, the game as a whole, I have to say, in general, F123 has proven to be somewhat of a rarity, a new release that both performs well and plays well. And with the frankly amazing performance we saw at some of these settings, it would be easy for pretty much anyone to find the right settings to get this game running on their particular system. Whether you're pushing the latest hardware and want to maximize frame rates and visuals, or if you're still on an older card and just want to play the game above 60 FPS, I'd like to think that there is something that will work for you too. Even if you are on an RX 6500 XT, which we kind of showed was pretty terrible in everything apart from 1080p. So there we have it. 
It's been a, a long one this time since we had so much to look at and talk about, but hopefully you enjoyed it and stuck with me. And let me know in the comments section below. Are you a fan of the F1 series? Have you tried the latest game in the franchise? I'd be eager to see actually how popular these games still are. For me personally, I'm still waiting for a new Dirt game to come, so hopefully that's going to be next. And that about wraps this one up. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider joining the exclusive Patreon club, where you get access to a ton of cool extras, including behind the scenes content, monthly live Q&A sessions, a special secret area on our Discord, and much, much more. The link for all that good stuff is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys.